who has had a profound impact on the world. At Millsaps College, we teach students how to think, how to serve others, how to lead, and how to engage in lifelong learning. I can think of no greater professor of such lessons than the one you are about to hear tonight. Lady Thatcher is a woman of vision who willed herself to succeed as a scholar, chemist, lawyer, political leader, prime minister, baroness, college chancellor, writer, renowned speaker, and tonight, a professor. Lady Thatcher is a sterling example of the liberal arts education. Please join me in welcoming Lady Margaret Thatcher. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to come to this great college, have the chance of speaking with you, and I hope the chance of answering a lot of questions afterwards. I note that the college was founded as long ago as 1890. It's a Methodist foundation and has a great reputation for excellence. It is quite by chance, perhaps, that I come here. I was brought up in the Methodist faith. My father was a keen Methodist and a, a local government preacher, as well as taking his ordinary task uh, as a, a, a grocer uh, in our hometown, which is always very busy. And in those days, in wartime, we had rationing. It was even more difficult still. But I know full well the greatness of the Methodist faith, and I know very well the marvelous music that we used to sing and we always performed, either the Messiah or one of the great Bach chorales. My friends, I went myself in wartime to Somerville College, Oxford. It so happened that I became 17, uh, and when there was a war on, and we were able actually to go up at 17 and not have to wait until 18. I read science, chemistry, conscious of the privilege of being at university. And Sunday evening service was taken by our principal. We read her advice. She's a great scholar of English literature, but she always told us that the college was founded to teach religion, learning and education. Religion came first, as first in value and endowed with unalienable rights. And she pointed out that biblical ethics gave us the most precious insights into what constitutes that just order which it is the purpose of politics to achieve. That was just very much the kind reassurance and advice we needed because it was 1943 wartime and we needed all the encouragement that there was a good future that we could get. My friends, I'm delighted to be at this college. It has a tremendous reputation for excellence and it is deeply philosophical. Most of my life there has been a battle between the political systems that should govern a free society. We were, of course, battling during wartime against the terrors of Nazism, fascism, all of those systems that deny the freedom of the individual and substitute the diktat of a dictator. And in those countries, there is no understanding of the biblical ethic, there is no understanding of the philosophy of freedom, and there is no understanding 
of the real essence of humanity and its needs. Everything is dictated. I am just old enough to remember, to remember Nazism. And I remember it especially because my father was a Rotarian and all of a sudden in 1938, we had a request from uh, uh, someone in Austria whom we happened to know as a Rotarian and he wrote to my father and said the Nazis have entered Austria and those of us who happened also to be Jewish are some of our daughters being taken away. If I can get my daughter out of Austria, can you take her? And we did. And she came. And eventually she went to Latin America. But we heard a very great deal of the terrors of that regime. And of course it's etched on one's mind forever. And we shall never forget those who gave their lives that a free society, a law-governed society, might prevail. My friends, there has been this battle of political systems between freedom under a rule of law and democracy on the one hand, and on the other hand, either fascism, Nazism, or communism. That was fought out during my lifetime. We lost many, many soldiers in seeing that our own particular system triumphed. Today, we are thankful for their sacrifice, and we owe it to them to build as good a society, not only for ourselves, but for the other countries in the world who've never known liberty. Even today, my friends, there are fewer than half the countries in the world which are free in the sense that we are. Freedom, a law-governed liberty, and democracy. So we have a great deal, a very long time to go. Now, can I turn from that general politics to the economic side. No more do we experience the severe economic cycles that used to be a great characteristic. I think it is the wisdom of some of the economists that have been so attentive to analyzing what was wrong. And I said to Alan Greenspan, the other day I happened to be sitting next to him. Congratulations, I think you have really found the success of getting an economy running steadily well and without falling into recession. We've had it now for quite a long time and yet years ago we got a boom and then we got a recession and of course it was extremely difficult because you would get a good deal of unemployment for a time and nothing is worse than wanting to do a work and, and not having a job. I think that is a great achievement, a steady increase in the economy, a steady improvement in what we can achieve and a steady improvement in what we can buy and in how we can help other people short of resources. It's one that we couldn't have thought of in pre-war days and during the 30s, which st is still etched on our minds to some extent. And I think it's come about because we've been able to judge the money supply and to keep the growth steady. That is the economic side. There are, of course, other sides which have not, in fact, worked out so well. Let's look at the political side the world over. I referred to some of it a moment ago. But I've had occasion to look up the record of communism, to see its real horrors. We knew about them, of course, but not as far how bad they were. Just remember, we of our generation were facing two terrible tyrannies, Nazism and communism. By a stroke of good fortune, if I might put it that way, Hitler attacked Russia, and so Russia was on our side, and we and Russia were fighting Nazism. Had it not been that way, we might have been in very considerable difficulties. As we studied more and more of the communist system, and we had occasion to do so, and of course, Winston Churchill knew a great deal about it, and he was always the most marvelous orator. 
we discovered just exactly the extent of the tyranny which we had not known. One of the organizations, in fact, has worked it out. It's a, it's a book called The Black Book of Communism, published in Paris in 1997. My friend, taking into account executions, famines, provoked and not, or not remedied, deportations, the numbers killed or deported under or through communism are estimated in total at 100 million. And the crimes of Nazism are estimated at 25 million. They are terrible figures. Each represents a life. And it's not surprising that we, in fact, had to fight for liberty. It is perhaps one of the great achievements that we have had that liberty for a considerable time, thanks to the United States, and we have not, apart from local wars, and those are difficult enough, we have not, apart from those, had another great international war. We have had, nevertheless, one or two local wars. Let me say, one of the ones that happened when I was in office was the one which arose from supplies of oil in the Middle East. And I remember very well the day when Saddam Hussein invade, invaded Kuwait. Immediately, the West went to defend Kuwait and to stop that invasion from going any further. Because had he got right down the Gulf, the supplies of oil would have been constrained for a very long time. We never expected in my generation to have to do that. But when the, cha when the challenge came, we did so, and again, that in fact uh, was not, t did not turn into a tremendous crisis. We also were not able, if I might put it that way, to do what I would have preferred to have done. I had just left office at the time to have had the troops that were there go right into Iraq, right to Baghdad, and see off Saddam Hussein. Life would have been... <laughs> Life would have been very much easier for us now, and very much better for the whole of the Middle East, had we done so. I think that is more the case, and I regret it even more, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was a remarkable occasion, we still don't know quite how or why it collapsed, but it did. The Soviet Union just disintegrated. Let me tell you the contact which I had had with them as Prime Minister. We got extremely worried about the whole future of communism and of the USSR. We had both communism to tackle uh, and we had the fascism as well. And we were trying to make contact with certain people in Russia. We succeeded in doing so because a certain Mr. Gorbachev had to leave Russia for two days to open some occasion in Canada and then asked if he could come and see us. But well, we didn't know anything about him. We were absolutely delighted that someone was going to come out to Russia, and it was the first time he'd ever been out of Russia, and it's the first time, therefore, that he'd seen a free society in Canada. And then he came to us for five days. He and his very able wife, Raisa, came. He was quite different from any other Russian that I had ever met. First, he didn't have a whole sheaf of papers for briefing, which normally if you talk to a, someone who comes to speak to you from Russia, they'd look at their sheaf of papers, go like that and pull one out and give the reply, whether it was material or not, to the question. Not a bit with Mr. Gorbachev. He had a small little notebook. If I asked him something, he'd just look up the question. He could argue, he could discuss, and so could his lady wife. He came allegedly for lunch at Chequers and then for two hours afterwards. Well, after a further four hours, I said to him, I th thought he ought to get back to London because I knew that he had some uh, duties there. The point is, we had a genuine conversation, a genuine discussion, arguing, of course, he would never say there was anything wrong at that stage with communism. 
but arguing about it time and time again. There was a story told that Brezhnev, who of course was a Russian communist and, and in charge at one time, when he died, was tackled upstairs as to which way he would go. And he was told that he'd have to go to the underworld, to, 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 in, in, into a hell. Um, and um, uh, would he like, uh, would he like either to uh, one, one set of comforts or another? Um, he chose, in fact, I know what he was asked, what, he, would, he like, he, would he like a warm fire? Yes, he would. And would he, in fact, uh, like, what would he like it to be made of? And he said he wanted it made fully uh, of the ordinary coal and ash. And uh, he said, they said to him, why did you choose coal down there? And he said, well, I chose a communist hell, because that's what it was, because I knew full well that supplies would always be short. <laughs> and uh, I expect he was granted his wish. Much later, of course, by accident, Mr. Gorbachev became leader of the whole Soviet Union. In the meantime, Mr. Yeltsin had been to see me. Mr. Yeltsin was rather different, and I said, I've sure just seen Mr. Gorbachev. He said, yes, I know. But these were his words. He said, I've come to tell you, Mrs. Thatcher, that I want to stand for election to be the first president of Russia. Now, Russia is the biggest country, obviously, in what was then the Soviet Union, with their four other countries around. I was absolutely amazed, and to this day I don't know why. He's the first, I think, and only person that has actually been the elected president of Russia, because he was elected uh, and has, was president for a very long time. Then, for reasons that we don't know, the Soviet Union fell apart. It was absolutely remarkable. We came to the end of the Cold War, an achievement, I think, due very much to Ronnie Reagan's firmness throughout his period of office, his firmness about SDI, and that, in fact, brought down the whole communist system, and it fell apart. And we were just left with the main Russian element of it, representing the old Soviet system, and Mr. Uh, Gorbachev, uh, not Mr. Mr. Gorbachev, um, had, in fact, uh, become, almost by chance, because he'd stood for election, he became the president uh, of Russia. These things happen very strangely. Looking now at Russia, it's very sad. What we hadn't considered, and perhaps what we should have considered, is when a total dictatorship collapses, who takes over and what is the structure there is no structure of law. There is no financial structure. Everything is the diktat of the Communist Party. And there's no structure of administration. So you go from total tyranny to a freedom without the essential structures of freedom. And it has been very difficult when we have given a considerable amount of money to Russia for purposes of helping out the poor and building those structures that quite a lot of the money does not seem to have been used for the purpose for which it was given but has disappeared into the bank accounts of some people outside and the IMF are onto that now but it's difficult, I'm trying to point out the difficulty when you want to bring them to a democratic society the difficulty of doing so Alas, when the whole Soviet Union collapsed Mr. Gorbachev was left without a job. Mr. Yeltsin had one. Mr. Gorbachev did come over here to speak, but he was not able to speak in English any more than we could speak in Russian. And we have not seen a great deal of him since. Now we have the new Mr. Putin. Uh, I 
looked at the pictures of Mr. Putin, trying to look for a trace of humanity. Um, I should, within a few weeks, have known better, because you know what happened. They had the terrible tragedy of the submarine going down straight to the, to the floor. Whether there was an explosion inside or not, we don't know. But it was very interesting what happened. If ever there's a calamity in the West, the whole of the armed forces will go, they'll take everything there immediately. The politicians immediately will get together and say, what help do we want? They can have anything we can give. If we haven't got the help, we'll get it from someone else. There would be anxiety because what mattered was not the submarine, but the lives of those in. And the interesting thing was that the new leader of the Soviet Union didn't act quickly. This was very soon the comment. He didn't try to mobilize everyone else. We didn't know whether we could help, but we were all ready to go and help and sent some of the small submarines that we had just for such an occasion. But that, my friends, was very, very revealing indeed. They still do not value human life in the same way that we do. And so, all the help got there, I'm afraid, really rather late. And I'm a very relieved in one way that Mr. Putin got so much criticism for what he should have done but didn't. And that again shows that the Soviet Union and the peoples of the Soviet Union are very much aware of what could be done, a great deal more could be done than is being done at the moment. It is not easy for Russia to come to a free enterprise society I've been round some of their factories in the days when they're totally run by communism because there aren't enough people who have, are trained to take managerial decisions. And so, as you know, Russia, in spite of the fact that it has, has probably more natural resources than anyone else in the world, any other country in the world, is not coming out of poverty into a successful society, and it should. It's not for us, I'm afraid, to be able to go in and help, although we're always ready to do so. And one cannot be very optimistic at the moment. One can only, in fact, be relieved that the dangers of Russia and her enmity have been removed. We would like to see them replaced by a society that would be good for the people of Russia, that they would know freedom and they would know a very much better standard of living. Now, can I turn quickly to one of the other communist states, China? Uh, again, the, well, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, nation in the world, 1.2 billion. I had to deal with China for quite a time because of Hong Kong. Now, Hong Kong has been a British colony since uh, for, for just over now 100 years. The small island of Hong Kong was freehold years and years and years ago. Years and years and years ago, the small island wasn't enough, so we had to go back to China, my forebears had to go back to China, to try to get some more land. And they let us buy some on the mainland, but they wouldn't let us have it freehold. It was a 99-year lease, and the lease fell in during my time. Now the interesting thing is that the Hong Kong island and that little bit of land ran a fully free enterprise system. We were still governors at that time. A fully free enterprise system. And with Chinese people, you know how able they are. Chinese talent and ability, a full free enterprise system and a rule of law. In other words, a British or Western mechanism was very highly successful. The average income for Chinese uh, on the Hong Kong and the British mainland was something like $28,000 Hong Kong dollars a year. The average income for Chinese people in China, the same talents and abilities, but under a communist system, $800 a year. Vastly different. And I remember saying 
to Deng Xiaoping, who in fact started economic liberty in China, who would not give political liberty. Uh, why don't you r run the system very much as we do? But no, they have given them economic liberty. They can set up their small businesses. They have markets. But they will not give them political liberty. And so when Hong Kong was returned to China, as it had to be when the lease came to an end, I had already done a deal with Deng Xiaoping that for 50 years they would be able to keep their own rule of law and their own economic system. Now it's interesting, isn't it, that main land block, you've got the Iron Curtain, you go right across Russia and then right across China, was communist. And because it was communist, they were poor. On the West in Europe, because we had a free enterprise system, because we had a, a parliamentary system, because we had a rule of law, they, they, we were a rich society. It's nothing to do with the talents of the people. It's to do with the, with the kind of system under which they live, whether it encourages those talents and abilities or not. I have had to go to China from time to time and I sometimes see the rulers and I'm quite convinced it will take a long time for them to, I, to think of giving either a democratic system and they would not give up a rule of law. So we shall not see uh, the talents and abilities of those people being able to flourish uh, as they should. Now there are also, there, let's get, have a look at the rest of the um, states that are still in considerable difficulty. Now also what we call the rogue states. There's North Korea, which is a highly socialist system. South Korea has been uh, independent, but formerly under uh, America, highly prosperous. There ha is Iraq, which of course is under Saddam Hussein, under a dictatorship, a very rich country, rich in oil, as we know but the people not necessarily allowed to partake of all of those riches. Uh, you're very much aware of Saddam Hussein who invaded Kuwait, uh, and we were afraid at one time that he might go all the way down the Gulf, which is all the oil sheikdoms, and then he would have had a very considerable rule over a large part of the world. Fortunately, America came across the Atlantic. Uh, we were mobilized immediately and several other countries and we saved Kuwait. Again, I think it would have been better, as I indicated earlier, had we gone back to Baghdad and sorted that man out. Um, <laughs> Iran, as you know, President Carter had a great deal of difficulty with Iran. It's all these, uh, these countries around the Mediterranean. Syria, has still had a dictator for a very long time. His son has now taken over. There is this group, Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Libya on the other side. It's strange that with so many countries coming to democracy, these, uh, there, they are uh, on the whole uh, Mohammedan, these are sticking to their former uh, dictatorships and not freeing up at all. Now, Libya we had great trouble with, as you know. Perhaps you don't remember, but I recall the time when Ronnie Reagan rang me up and said, look, we can't take what's happened, what Libya's doing very much longer. What they were doing was uh, putting terrorist tactics among many of, the American many of the American armed forces in Europe. They were, in fact, uh, killing quite a number and causing a great deal of trouble. Now, Ronnie, as you know, is always very decisive. Ronnie Reagan is one of my heroes. I, <laughs> he had a passion for a law-governed liberty. He could express it in marvelous, clear, simple language. He had a lovely voice, and he never, never faltered in his beliefs. And I remember the first time he came to an international conference, I think it was one, one in Canada, and he said, said quietly, very quietly, as he always did, uh, and then he spoke just a little bit, and the next conference was in Paris.
and President Mitterrand was in a chair. It was a group of seven, each our prime ministers or presidents with our foreign secretaries and also with our chancellors of the Exchequer. And we'd had quite a good debate in the morning, about 20 to 1, and President Mitterrand knew that lunch would not be ready. He was a Frenchman, he always knew exactly whether lunch would be ready or not. <laughs> and you know it'd be good when it was ready. And Ronnie Reagan hadn't spoken. And so President Mitterrand turned to Ronnie Reagan. It had been a quite tough economic break. Mr. President, would you like to make a contribution? Now, Ronnie could make a contribution at any time. And he did, in that very quiet voice, and in very uh, dissecting the whole problem into very simple terms. He spoke quietly and brilliantly until one minute to one. <laughs> Absolutely. And I've never seen President Mitron practically knocked out before. <laughs> and he was absolutely shattered. So were the others. I mean, I knew just exactly what Ronnie Reagan could do. But at that time, it was 1982, he'd not long been president. I think he won the hearts and minds of everyone. And from that time, he got the proper recognition, which he should have, because I think in his presidency, he probably did more for the freedom of the world than almost anyone else. <laughs> well, my friends, let's have a look, not so much at foreign affairs, but at home affairs. I think we now have the right financial recipe to keep a reasonable prosperity going, as I indicated earlier. I hope that is true. We haven't had any recessions, and it will be a great benefit to the whole world if we're able to get there. That, I think, has been the reason why we haven't had inflation. Uh, obviously, we haven't had recessions. And I remember congratulating uh, the American government on this achievement. It is, of course, due to, to, the, to the bank governor, as you know, that it has happened that way. So what next and what now? Let's turn them from the economics to the social economic policy. That is a good deal more difficult. Let me just give you some statistics. If things go wrong socially or with the family, it's not easy for governments to put right. You can change certain financial things and make certain financial grants available. But just let me give you a few figures. Today, only 40% of American children reach the age 18 with a mother and father who are still married. Second thing on parents, 20 million children now live with single parents in the United States. Of these 12 point million children live in the poorest families. Also go over, have a look. Federal and state governments currently spend roughly $150 billion a year subsidizing single parents. And according to the United States Bureau of the Census, America's divorce rate is the highest in the world. You consequently, when the family breaks down, it's not all families breaking down, but too large a proportion, tend to get, if family breakdown increases, crime increases, and for each 10% increase in single parent families in the United States, violent teen crime increases 17%. Now, there are many, many more figures that I could give you. But that is appalling. Years and years ago, we would have hoped that when we had a richer society, a society in which families not only had enough, but more than enough, that we would have had a more moral society, that the standard for living would go up, as well as the standard of living. That, I'm afraid, does not, in fact, seem to have happened. And the greater amount of money available has not led to wiser spending, but has led 
to many of these difficult problems of the family breaking down. I must just give you one other encouraging thing. Research shows that church girls are more likely to be married, less likely to be divorced, and more likely to have higher levels of satisfaction in marriage. Research shows that church attendance is the most important predictor of marital stability and happiness. Well, now that's encouraging. So we get more people to go to church, uh, if we can. But it is, you, if, if you get the family breakdown, increasing crime, it attacks civilization itself. And that, of course, uh, is, is extremely difficult. Now, can I just quickly turn to one or two other points. I think why we have had such a successful economy is because we've had a few people at the top of government who in fact have got the right policies, consulted their, their, their banks, and for that reason the economy has kept well for a very long time. The problem now is the other challenge which I've indicated, uh, which I'm afraid is very much more difficult to tackle. If we go from there back to the international institutions, I'm often asked sometimes why the United Nations shouldn't make certain decisions. And they shouldn't make certain decisions. They are a debating, a, a debating position. They are a debating organization, and it's right that they should be. Now, why shouldn't they make decisions? Well, let me tell you, I can il illustrate by the Falklands. All of a sudden, one uh, Tuesday evening, while I was sitting waiting to go and reply in the House of Commons to a debate, I had a message that the Argentinian fleet had sailed, and from what had been put on board, our advisors in the Argentine, or who were there, thought that they were probably going to attack the Falklands. And if they did, it would arrive at about Friday or Saturday. Um, it is a terrible piece of news, but one had immediately to take action. Uh, I called in the, the senior band, Minister of Defense, and three other of my ministers came into my room that night. Now, I've never understood why some people in politics find it difficult to make decisions. We were, I really haven't. Uh, we were faced, we were faced with something that may, that may be going to happen. So immediately I called in the, the uh, Secretary of State for Defense who came straight in and one of the admirals as to precisely what we could do because it was now Tuesday and if they were going to, to land it would be either on Friday or Saturday morning. I've never known people to be more calm it's a great tribute to English forces and to American ones. They can take anything calmly and make provision calmly. I said to the Admiral, if they, they, if they invade, what can you do? Very steadily, he said, I can put out straight away so many aircraft carriers, two big aircraft carriers, so many big destroyers and frigates, and they can be ready to sail within 48 hours. Now I thought this was terrific. And I said to him, that's, are you sure that's right? 48 hours is pretty quick. But he told me a rule of NATO, which I hadn't known, and which you possibly don't know. It is a rule that NATO ships must be, or ships seconded to NATO or available to NATO, must be able to go to their destination within two days, within 48 hours. So they kept on board all of the military equipment and shells and so on that they needed. And all we had to do was to get the food and stores on. So we did that. And then I had to call Parliament. I called the Cabinet. Then I called Parliament for the Saturday morning. I thought, well, they'll probably all be gone to football matches or something like that. I shan't get many there. Not a bit of it. The place was full. About, there were about 650 members of Pond, about 600 were there. There wasn't room for everyone to sit down. But they were furious. They weren't going to have it. They weren't going to have our territories invaded and our people put under foreign 
jurisdiction. And so we passed a motion that Saturday that the fleet would sail on Monday. And the fleet sailed. It reached that three weeks later. Again, one was very worried because it was known that the fleet were going. It was known that they would reach there three weeks later. Would they have enough firepower to be able to cope? And they did. And as you know, within a few weeks, the Falkland Islands were restored. Now, I give you that as an example of the speed with which the Army and Armed Forces can react, of their competence, and of course, to the delight of the people, the islands were better, were, were restored. The things they told us about the occupation uh, by the Argentinians were not at all attractive, and the things that they told us about how badly the Argentinian officers treated the soldiers probably was one explanation of why we did not have over much difficulty in retaking the Falkland Islands. Now I thought it was, I tell you that because it showed the competence of the armed forces under NATO. They are in fact ready to go at any time. Now my friends, we had a look therefore at the, at the economy we had a look at some of the foreign affairs. May I say then the next point, but I won't take too long because you're listening marvelously. <laughs> Absolutely marvelously. Oof, I'd better be um, short. The next point is a social one. It is the one I think that I referred to, family breakdown, only 40% of American children reach age 18. The mother and father are still married. 20 million children now live with single parents in the United States. Of these 12.6 million live in the poorest families. Now my friends, the point I want to make is this. It's easier to get the economy right, to get the finances right, to keep them right, to keep a steady economy, than it is ever to cure a behavioral problem. And we really have a behavioral problem. As a young person in politics, I would never have thought that a greater income would have led to greater problems. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, everywhere. But we really have a problem here because there are many children who go home to without a mother in the house and with the breakup of families. What we are finding is it's easier to cure the economics than it is to cure the behavioral problems. I don't know quite how we cope with this, we can do as much as we can through all of the local communities and through the local churches. But my first instinct is the right one. It was totally unfair on the children if they can't go home and be sure of a welcome and be sure that everything is ready for them. And it is a much more difficult problem to cure than anything else that we have before us. So we're now getting family breakdown on a large scale. And for each 10% increase in single parent families, violent teen crime increases by 17%. This is the most difficult one. We now have, I think, an excellent standard of living with the chance always of improving ourselves. We now have people reasonably well housed. We now have the overwhelming majority of our people living extremely good lives. We now have the English-speaking peoples of the world being ready to go and defend tyranny wherever it occurs. We keep reasonable relations with some of those who were previously our enemies. We have excellent relations with Germany, part of Europe, and we keep reasonably good relations with Russia. And we hope never to have the kind of problem that we've had before. So how did this come about? I think it came about from the determination of the democratic nations, Ronnie Reagan and your good selves in particular, we always backing up and after all having been a slightly older nation than the United States. Um, we always expected uh, to give an example. And so my friends, we have got that, we've got the higher standard of living, I think we have got the means always and the armed forces in case they are needed as they went to the Gulf 
uh, as, as we sent ours to the Falkland Islands. We've got that. But it is now the behavioral problems that we're up against. Now, in making some of these decisions, do personalities matter? Yes, they do. Personalities mattered in the late 1930s when Churchill and Roosevelt were in charge. They were capable of summing up a situation and making a decision clear cut and putting it into action. Hence began the defeat of the Nazi system and the freedom restored to mainland Europe. Uh, that was due to their capability uh, to make a quick decision. There are others too, if I might say so, who can also make it. The other, uh, Ronnie Reagan mattered because he was a person who could make it. There were several other leaders who were always prepared. Winston Churchill and Roosevelt were one, another, Ronnie Reagan was one, and there are certain other people from other countries who are capable of making it very quickly. Uh, President Mitterrand could always make a decision very quickly. Uh, and it's extremely useful because for every day you gain, the problem is easier than it would be if you just waited for something else, something more difficult to develop. And so, my friends, as we go on to questions, can I sum up like this? We live today in a world that Ronald Reagan created, a world not without serious flaws, as he would wryly acknowledge, but a world of wider freedom, expanding prosperity, of surer peace and stability, a world far better than that which prevailed when Ronnie entered office in 1981. My friends, we have so much to be thankful for, and may I say thank you to America for the lead that she has always given. Thank you. Thank you so much for your thank you so much for your brilliant lecture and um, I'm delighted that you have time for questions what I would like to ask each of you if you would pass the questions that you have written down to our ushers and they will bring them up here to me and I will select a few to ask our professor this evening as the ushers are completing that though Lady Thatcher, I would like to ask the first question. You are certainly a remarkable role model for women in leadership. Could you describe for us some of the challenges that you faced in a male-dominated profession and how you met those challenges? Well, I think they were more afraid of me than I was of them. <laughs> As you're, in your role as professor tonight, what advice would you give our students on how they can prepare to be leaders for tomorrow? That's very difficult. You prepare to be leader by joining some organization in which you can gradually go up in the organization and take the chairman's job. Or you take, uh, well, if you're going to be a good leader, you take the chairman's job. Or you always are prepared to take a lead. Whether it be on anything local, you don't wait for someone else to take the lead. You will take the lead and make your views known. Or you will take the lead in some of the organizations in university. Leaders are people who can't just hang back. will have a, an idea how to go forward. They'll have more than an idea. They'll have the resolve to put that idea into operation 
and they'll have the personality to get other people with them and to support it. That's quite a lot. There are quite a lot more people capable of leadership than we see. But in a society, a free society, we have so many voluntary organizations uh, that there is a great deal of scope for leadership. And that is why we're really not only such a, a wealthy society, but we're also a very good society using that word in its real sense that we will not see someone else in difficulty without going to help them, whether it be a nation, or whether it be a family, or whether it be a child. All of those are characteristics of a society based on biblical values, because freedom is a, a, a biblical attribute. It's the dignity of the individual to the freedom, and it is not just uh, something given by Plato or someone from way back in that time. It is a biblical attribute and therefore it carries with it the duties that you use that freedom to good effect. Okay. You referred to Ronald Reagan as one of your heroes. Who would you consider to be some of your heroines? I happen to be fortunate in having a very good tutor, Oxford, He's a brilliant chemist, a very quiet person. She was a crystallographer. Uh, she was my tutor. And the task in those days, there was a new substance called penicillin. It had been isolated, knew full well of its medicinal value. And the task was, could we decipher the structure of penicillin and in fact try to synthesize it instead of growing it, uh, which uh, took a great deal of time. And Dorothy Hodgkin is a Nobel Prize winner, is in charge of this. It's quite remarkable to see how she worked. One had often thought that working in the scientific sphere it's almost pure logic or pure mathematics or working in so many ways and putting things through computers which we just got then to get the answer. It isn't. There's a gap between that and the solution. That gap is filled by inspiration. Dorothy would be looking at the, all the materials we got and all. You, you, if you want to find the structure of a crystal, you, you get the make it as good a crystal as you can, develop, put it on a tiny little piece of glass. You take that piece of glass with a mechanism underneath, bombard that glass several directions with X-rays. When the X-rays hit something like an atom in the crystal, an atom will deflect the X-rays onto a photographic panel and from the, the, dots, the, the dots that we get from that deflection as the thing rotates, you can see where the atoms are and the structure, where the, what the structure is in the crystal and within the atoms. That was what we, I hope, anyone a good crystallographer here? I hope I've, I've given a reasonable account of that. Now, Dorothy had a genius. She looked at all of these damn dots all over the place. And, and uh, every, every other scientist knew it. All of a sudden, she'd come out and she'd say, could the structure be this? No one else had ever thought of that structure. So you put that structure uh, and, and tried that structure with the x-rays, and it matched the crystal. So it was fascinating to watch. Even with all of the brilliance, with the maths, with the chemistry, with the physics, all the uh, x-ray apparatus, so much of the scientific solutions of this computer is better than any man has created. All of a sudden, put it with this, and it is. So we've each got a computer, and it's a very good one. Okay. What are your thoughts on the United States' current military status and the state of preparedness for what is the state of preparedness, your opinion, on the United States' current military status? My guess is that they'll never let it go below, uh, below what, what um, they should maintain. Uh, that won't stop certain people criticizing, but they always do. 
I, my guess is that they will let, keep it for what must be maintained, for the duties they know about, and for the uncertainties which may materialize. Um, the, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that that's, that's still... Okay, why does Britain have the highest taxes in Europe on oil and gas? It was a chance of the Exchequer wants more money. <laughs> It's a scandal. I'm afraid we, I'm afraid we were guilty too. Uh, you see, instead of doing a direct tax, you put a tax on petrol on every gallon, and then you add to that tax, and then you add to that tax again, so that for every tuppence that goes to the price of petrol, we in Britain have eight pence that goes to the chance of the exchequer, and it's too much, and people are rebelling. Good luck to them. It's just too much. But you do, you, do have to, you do have to tick your politicians off sometimes uh, if they try to get too much money, either by direct taxes or indirect taxes. Because if you take much, you're taking away from the people who can probably use it much better to much better effect either in a business or in their home life or in doing good works. In your studied opinion, what is the biggest threat to world peace at this time? The biggest threat, I think, comes from what are called the rogue states. Iraq, the Iran, the Syria, Libya. Now, we've seen off Libya, thanks to Ronnie Reagan. Let me tell you about that. I, I had it on my agenda, but I thought it would take too long. Remember that, uh, that uh, Gaddafi, uh, was, in fact, as I indicated, attacking American troops on the continent or putting various bombs, uh, mechanisms that, that blew things up near where they were. Only and then couldn't stand it any longer, quite right. And he rang me up one day and said, one evening, I'm told it's about 11 o'clock at night, our time, um, he wanted to do a raid on Libya, on, on Gaddafi, have to use all of the American planes based in Britain, would it be all right to use them? Well, he knew full well that I would say yes. Um, but we knew by allowing our bases to be used that we would get criticism from a lot of other countries who were not bold enough to deal with Gaddafi. And we did. But that raid took place on a Monday night. I remember it well. Got a message. I don't tell anyone else except two people. Once you let that out, even to, to you can let it out to your cabinet. Let it out to my foreign secretary, my chancellor exchequer, and myself, and no one else. And it held. And then the airplanes took off. It happened that night that I was at a function of uh, the Great Economist magazine, and walked in at um, 8:30 in the evening. And the editor of The Economist, whose part it was, I knew quite well, said, good heavens, Margaret, you do look pale. He said, pale, Andrew? I never look pale. You must be losing your sight. <laughs> but that, you see, that they'd taken off, I was worried. However, that raid took place. No other country in Europe even allow the American planes to overfly. They had to take off from, from London, then you've got the English Channel, they took off there, then they had to go all the way around the outline of Europe, come in again through Gibraltar, which was ours, it was all right for them to come in through that, and then go in, and then go in Libya. And we really were on tenterhooks. Raid was a great success. Uh, one plane was lost, uh, we don't quite know why, um, but the success was obvious. I knew we would get criticism the next day as I went out. I'll tell you why, because that one plane we lost actually crashed on a small village and one child was killed, or they told us one child was killed. If one child was killed, you can imagine that there was a great deal of hostility. Well, was it right to do the raid at all? You had to take the chance. And so, 
we got only uh, great criticism from our local press for doing it. It wasn't until a long time later, or several months later, when it stopped Gaddafi from doing anything else bad in Europe or attacking some of the American forces. People realized that that raid had had its effect. But it was Ronnie's idea. He couldn't get, in spite of all of the American troops in Europe, therefore the gratitude that Europe should have had to him. No one else except us. Now the, the planes went from us. to allow do anything to help that flight. It was a successful raid. We've had no trouble from Gaddafi since. That was an absolutely typical decision of Ronnie Reagan having taken the decision, didn't let many people know, only those who needed to know, and the raid was a success. I will have one last question, and the last question is this. In this world of increased globalization of businesses, formation of strong alliances such as the EU and the North America free trade market, and the introduction of new economies such as the Euro, we are seeing new dynamics on the influence of the internal business of one country by others. How do you view the future of individual nations to self-govern, and do you see us headed towards several world governing bodies? I am not for globalization. I prefer to have my own decisions under my own hand to my own people and to cooperate voluntarily with other countries of like mind. <laughs> that way you get the best results. And when you in party to the decision, yes, I will go with that group, you will make the decision. You'll get far better results. I don't like these massive groups. I like to have the responsibility myself, and I think countries like to have the responsibility in the hands of their own representatives. So, just don't like globalization. Um, you have to belong to the United Nations, but just remember this, the United Nations talks, the Security Council talks. It's the individual nations which choose and which do the fighting, not the generality. I've been had to do a fighting both in, in the Middle East and in the Falklands. I simply said to our ambassador on the United Nations, you know we're, we're doing the right thing, get a motion from the United Nations to uh, support what we're doing, and then keep them out of it. Because it's my soldiers that are going down. And that was the way to play it. At this evening's gathering, as the evening's gathering uh, draws to a close, I would like to take a moment to extend a special thank you to the sponsors of the first Millsaps Nova series. Thank you to Bancor South, Bell South, Bell South Mobility, the L.M. Berry Company, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Mississippi, East Group Parkway Foundation, Intergy of Mississippi, Mr. and Mrs. Stuart C. Irby, Jr., and Mr. and Mrs. Billy L. Walker. And Lady Thatcher, we want to thank you for a brilliant evening, and as a token of our appreciation, we would like for you to have one of our New Century Millsaps books to take home as a memento of this occasion. Thank you.